Back oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jacked up the entrance. <laughs> Welcome back, beautiful humans. Uh, that was an amazing start because this is episode 100, which I stopped including the episode number at the beginning of the segments because they've been kind of depending on the recording time or whatever. I've been shuffling them around, but this is going to be episode 100 regardless. And I am so stoked because it features uh, my best friend on this planet, David Maudsley, British Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so this is probably going to be unlike every other uh, episode where we're actually going to have a formal conversation. This is probably going to be a lot of jokes and stuff, but Dave, yeah. Dave what's up? <laughs> Put two Daves in a room. What do you got? Plus, I don't know. <laughs> uh how are you doing dave doing good mate you know just just trying to take life slow right now well but also staying super busy at the same time okay i um i want to start um because obviously we know each other super well you've been doing footwear design since a lot i think a lot longer than people recognize it's been from what i saw online 13 plus years at this point um why do you keep doing it like what what still motivates you to design after all these years when you know the world's abundant and you can try to pursue anything else that you want to pursue i don't know it's, it's it might be a cliche to say it but it's kind of all i know but it isn't all i know because it's footwear design hasn't necessarily been all i've done it's the footwear industry is something I've been a part of for a while and other experiences have come in and out, it's like looking back on my resume and all the th different things I've done within footwear. Uh, but the main kind of driving point was, um, yeah, I don't know. Footwear is something I've always loved since I was a little kid, you know, this, and then, um, it's kind of just organically based upon things I've done in my life, like being a little kid, loving art, loving shoes through skateboarding. And then, I don't know, dude, it's just like this obsession that seems to never die. More always surrounded by shoes. They've got a closet filled with shoes. You do have a lot of um, shoes. I don't know. I feel like, this, yeah, I do have a lot of shoes, but I always think it's cool. Cause it's just like this, these different hurdles in life and you have moments of pinching myself. Where I'm like, oh, shit, I actually have this experience now. This is about to happen. So I think the pursuit of like the next level is, uh, something that keeps me going, you know, what's, I um, plateau. I want to keep what's been a fun pinch me moment so far uh, within that 13 years is there one one or two that stand out there's multiples man i mean i mean the main two i would say was well, main one being i actually you know walked onto the campus of nike and was there had a job at nike. <laughs> always wanted it childhood it's like what the, what the hell am i doing here is this real and then the other side of it is having to being able to or had the opportunities to meet what I would consider certain heroes within the industry or even around the industry. And then obviously, uh, um, those are kind of like main highlights. It's like different stories with different people, but yeah, pinch me moments like, uh, getting to do a collaboration with Takashi Murakami through concept kicks and then being able to get a job with Nike through that experience. So yeah, there's a couple of pinch me moments. I do remember even, even younger pinch me moments. There's some like other ones from, you know, being early twenties and stuff like teens, which is pitch me moments that kind of have nothing to do with my career, but more to do with my personal development. Well, let's deep dive into that. What's been a pinch me moment on the personal development side, take footwear out of it, right? You just talked about, you know, pursuing your lifelong dreams and you've been able to accomplish a multiple of those on the footwear side, but on the personal side, what's, uh, what's been a highlight for you? a major one is moving to America. Like I, I was kind of weird and surreal. Like I never really thought that I would ever move to the USA, but then because of my career, it kind of took me here. And it was some, obviously like a, it felt like a youth manifestation. You're a little kid in the UK, you kind of surrounded by US TV and culture. And then you have this kind of, I think most British people want to come to the US to see what it's like, but I had this obsession with wanting to live in America. Here I am now in Oregon of all places. It's, um, it's pretty cool. It's so like we, you, you've, you've been, we met through Instagram, which is pretty, I always tell people that story. Cause it's like, it's hard to believe because it like, and as soon as we met each other, it felt like we knew each other for years, which was pretty bizarre. Um, and ever yeah. since I met you, you talked about 
working for Nike and, you know, coming to America, which is pretty wild. And, you know, seeing you accomplish those things. And now you've been stateside for, I think, three or four years now. Yeah, four years, over four years. Four, four years. So like you're, you're definitely continuing to stack those wins uh, in those elements. And one of the coolest parts of, of your career, like actual footwear side, is that you studied actual footwear design, which not many people have a degree in and or really recognize. And so what do you think is the difference between, you know, how your education stacks and your knowledge base in footwear stacks against everybody else's simply because you studied four year footwear degree? Uh, I would say that it brought me more experiences early, um, whether or not those experiences are recognized now at the age that I am with the peers that I'm against or not against with, you know, who I share, share the same opportunities with. Um, I feel like it gave me more of an insight to that. The footwear industry isn't just design. You know, there's a, there's a huge spectrum of opportunities within the footwear industry, whether that being like, um, a bespoke last maker, you know, a, a leather worker, a maker, a cobbler, or even to the extent of like, you know, a salesman, a buyer, a merchandiser, marketeer, um, a PLM, a developer, uh, a CEO, you know, there's all these different opportunities that kind of expo that like, are in the photo industry. And I don't think if I, if I didn't have those experiences when I was younger, I wouldn't be able to see the bigger picture. Um, I think the advantage it gave me from a young age is to be able to see the footwear industry and that kind of gave me the the energy or the edge maybe to try and explore more and see more within the industry mm. um, so i think that's kind of the benefit of the program but the benefit of the program as well is like this is a specifically it's footwear design and making it was a bachelor's degree at de montfort university in leicester it's a three-year uh, course i graduated at the age of 20 when usually the graduation is 21 because i'm the youngest person in my year. Um, and that's, that's when I, st I started literally maybe three days after turning 18. So it was super like <laughs> condensed time, you know, formative years an 18 to a, well, 17 to a 20 year old, like being away from home for the first time. It's kind of crazy. Uh, having a little bit of an ego because that course is all I wanted to do since I was the age of like 13, 14, when I found out about it. So I was kind of obsessed with it and I was not letting anybody like step in front of me to make that, um, like a, a hard experience. You know what I mean? Um, I was trying to prove myself big time, especially being like a sneaky head, understanding the culture at that point, which is like 2000 and what, 2007 to 2010 before then as well, like multiple years before then. Um, I don't know if that's answered the question, but essentially, yeah, I, I think that having that course and having that experience gave me an advantage to kind of enter an industry and seeing kind of the bigger picture. Yeah, no, for, for sure. And, and you worked for a lot of, um, I'll call them little brands because I, I don't think they had a ton of exposure, um, right after you graduated, you know, you even had, um, again, I still don't think a lot of people know this, but you had like your own collaboration with Nubik, like, and you, yeah. you got to do all this, like, here, yeah. you, you did like this, you know, curated photography in the photo shoot and, you know, it had a uh, DM T F C on it, FC. right? David Maudsley, the footwear composer yeah. uh, acronym on the sneaker. <laughs> yeah. And like, I remember when you sent you me those that. sneakers, still one of my favorite sneakers I've ever gotten. There they are. Yeah. With new yeah, big, that's the logo for those watching on YouTube, check it out. And, um, it was, it was such a wild sneaker and like you got to collaborate on it. And so what was, what was that like? Cause you were still super youthful, um, back then when that came out. Super youthful. When was that? 2019, was it 2018, 2019? So I was like, I was pre 30, I'm 34 now. So I don't know. That was an interesting experience because I was working with Daniel and concept kicks. And I just left like a, a major job working as a buyer slash designer slash developer at a, a company called Foot Asylum, which is now owned by uh, the big JD uh, kind of corporation. Um, they have the ability of just eating up all these companies. And um, from there, it was kind of it was a lot at a young age to kind of, you know, 
learn how to buy, learn how to merchandise, also doing design and manufacturing. And then I just saw, I became really good friends with Daniel and then just sort of like, um, just a bigger opportunity to try and explore your own things. And then having sort of like being with Daniel, spent time with him. I think we pushed each other to kind of new boundaries. He was already kind of like, you know, skyrocketing, doing amazing things. His network's massive. He's such a well-connected person and had his point of view on his experiences or that kind of experience being an independent designer in the industry. And seeing him, or seeing one of my best friends, like design shoes with brands and having his name on it was kind of like a, I would say a small time aspiration for myself. But I think I was fortunate enough because of uh, Don Baton, the CEO and owner of Nubic. He reached out to me on Instagram and he actually asked me if I wanted to do a collaboration with him. And I was like, why would you want to do a collaboration with this kid? <laughs> like, I, sorry, I spit. <laughs> I have nothing to offer. You got to cut that out. You got to cut that out. You can't do that. That's staying. <laughs> um, anyway. Don, the CEO, Don Baton, then reached out to me on Instagram and I was like, why the hell does he want to work with me? Like, this makes no sense. But obviously he saw something in me and um, it was pretty like organic experience because he wanted me to design a shoe based on my own kind of vision. So he gave me full reins to design these, these models. Um, there was kind of a lot of back and forth in trying to decide where we wanted to go in terms of like the development of the product. Did we want every aspect of the shoe to be handcrafted or did we want to utilize like uh, pre pre existing toolings? So we actually used an outsole midsole that was created by forever uh, in Portugal, who now then um, Don was, was uh, gracious enough to open those malls and then actually utilize them for our, our collaboration and for other products they created. But essentially the collaboration was just like, look, it's a, an amalgamation of where I'm at as a designer at this point in time. I love formal wear, I love dress wear, I love sneakers, I love high quality leathers, asymmetry. So I just tried to just kind of like combine all those different aesthetic viewpoints to these two products. Um, and then I just thought it was right to call the, the products uh, the, um, the Dar and the Tanza, because I was actually raised in Dar Salaam in Tanzania when I was a kid. So it was nice to kind of like bring that there. But I think a massive learning uh, element of that project was like marketing is huge and something you really need to push. And that's something that looking back on now, if I was to change anything about that project was maybe like the, the level of marketing. Um, but I think like evidently now we live in a different society where marketing is huge. And if you're not seen, you're not seen. So right. I think, uh, going forward, if we to do anything like that again, it would probably have to do a massive push on marketing. Yeah. No, but it's still, it, it's, it's so wild that like you got to design from scratch and really build your own unique silhouette. Like there's a lot of really interesting design details, uh, on that sneaker. Um, it's so funny because even that, like when we talked previously on your favorite, uh, like pinch me moments, you didn't even mention like the collaborating on your own sneaker, which is, uh, it's, I know that's crazy. It's this is the problem I was saying to you before is like, I pulled up my LinkedIn because of all these things that's happened. And it's like every, every fucking year, there's a new pinch me moment. And it's, it's hard to kind of like pinpoint one, you know what I mean? Like this is a massive pinch me moment. Like I managed to actually design and make a shoe with my name on it. And I managed to gift to my friends and family and then people bought it and people were fans of it, which is crazy to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's a to be able to actually design something and give to the people I care about was pretty crazy. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's, thank you for that's, that. that's such a cool moment. Um, I want to fast track and talk about, this is a, a question that I didn't, I, I didn't tell you any of the questions I was going to ask you before going into this, but one of the things no, I didn't want to, I want to, uh, I wanted to talk about was, um, you know, you made it obviously to Nike. That's, that's what you do. You've been doing it. You moved to America. You don't know anybody. Um, you move very far away from home. Um, what has that experience been like? Because I talk to a lot of younger creatives or, or, or people who want to get into the industry. And I always talk about the word sacrifice and what you have to sacrifice in order to break into the industry. Like, what are you willing to give up? And yeah. you are somebody who gave up a lot. Yeah. And I want I, I wanted to specifically talk about that experience, what it's been like. I know it hasn't been all all highs like it's you know you're you're stranded on the west coast by yourself for so long you know 
Just what, what what's that uh what's that been like? Well, I think like you probably said it right. Um, you know, if you want to get the things you want, you have to sacrifice the things you love. And maybe that's how I perceived it. I've you you know it, you know me, you've seen what I've been through. And um to me, I felt like yeah, yeah, thank you for recognizing the fact that I've given up a lot of my personal life to be in the position where I'm at in terms of, you know, I got offered a job from Nike. I was living in the UA, in the UK. I was living um, with my family and, uh, and with my girlfriend at the time. And then, um, you know, I was working my ass off. I was like traveling the world, trying to develop shoes for different like independent brands. I worked with North Face for a period of time, um, you know, going in and out of Europe to try and develop products, in and out of Asia to develop products, to try and, you know, build a reputation as an independent designer and developer. And, and then to have like the offer laid on the table was kind of like a shock moment. And that would mean that I would have to, like you say, up and leave and move to the U S. Um, and at that point in my time in my life in 2019, beginning of 2019, um, maybe like six months before a year before I actually found out my dad was, uh, diagnosed with, uh, stage four lung cancer. So we knew at that time, you know, time's limited. And for me, a huge balance was like, I'm going to leave my family. I leave my dad who I might not get to see again. I'm going to leave, you know, uh, my girlfriend and try and figure out how we can, you know, make it work from long distance. And, um, with my, the, the biggest thing was my dad and that, you know, I, I, I dealt with so many guilty moments before leaving because I actually had those conversations with my dad and my dad was the one who pushed me. He was like, he literally said, you better fucking take this job <laughs> because I'm not going to be here forever. And you've been working your life for this. So you better fucking take this job. Mm. So to me, it was like, bro, if, if you're, if you, if you want this for me so badly that you're willing to say that, then I'm going to take it. Um, and again, lots of those conversations back and forth and, you know, I, I still today feel like a level of guilt, but I'm also very grateful for my dad giving me that permission. So mm. that's, that was a, a huge kind of, um, sacrifice, but fortunately, unfortunately, I was able to see my dad pass away. So I'm, I'm happy I had that experience to be able to see him and for him to be able to see me make my first steps as a footwear designer at Nike and move to America and live my dream. Um, well, the sacrifice is just like friends and family and relationships, you know, that, that's, that's a massive thing moving from somewhere so familiar, everybody around you, uh, the way of life, and then moving to the U S which is literally an alien country. <laughs> we both speak English, but English <laughs> is not the language we speak. It's so crazy You're dealing with like the different personality types, the egos, the relaxed situations, like the authoritarian situations in terms of like public, public spaces. And then literally, so I, I joined Nike, what, July, 2019. And then what the fuck happens in 2020? Yeah. Fucking COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't travel the world. could see my family. Yeah. Uh, it was wild, bro. It was the craziest fucking time. And then literally joined this company in an American culture, trying to figure out the culture, trying to figure out the way of the lay of the land, this like credit centric space, tax centric space, paying for medical health, all this <laughs> crazy stuff, and politics, and people and race situations and people getting sick, people not getting sick. What is COVID? Is it real? Is it not? All this kind of just like craziness that was happening. Um, but I'm grateful that that happened because it gave me the time to grow in a different way. So mm. I definitely wouldn't be the person if all that shit didn't happen. So I am grateful for those opportunities, but well, not even opportunities. I'm grateful for those moments, but they presented new opportunities. Yeah. So yeah. No, and, and especially, just... especially, especially in, uh, in Portland, Portland really went through the thick of it. in, in during COVID, um, not only with the, the riots, the protests, but then, you know, the sicknesses that Portland already has a, a huge struggle with homelessness. Um, and so, you know, definitely trying to figure out like, you know, I know you moved around a bunch in different apartments in different places. Um, you're trying to build friendships, which obviously like, you know, you're brand new to this country, trying to establish things, um, like that. Um, you know, you, you, 
I wanted to bring this up because you shifted your camera simply to to have uh, Bryce's uh, work behind you for those watching on YouTube, who's become a really good uh, friend of yours. Um, and so I want to talk about like how some of those friendships that you've been able to develop while your time like has really like helped you and, and supported you. And, um, you know, you found, you know, jujitsu in this community now and and uh, and these things that kind of help offset and, and balance you out a little bit. Yeah, I think um, maybe if COVID, oh, that's two ways to think about it. If COVID happened, if COVID didn't happen, would I have had the same experiences earlier? Or if COVID didn't happen, would I, you know, not have what I have today? And um, I think I was grateful enough to meet people who I got close with during that period of time. And, and um, Bryce and Mariah Wong, like, um, two of like the best people I know in Portland that I love and I'll ride or die. You know what I mean? Like they have so much time for me. They, they were there when I was like in heavy weights of emotion. And I think I, I might've been there for them in a couple of points of time too. You know what I mean? We're all stuck in COVID. Like why not spend some time with your friends? You know what I mean? And I think our relationship got stronger throughout that period of time, but also mine and yours, dude. You know what I mean? I know that we had like separation in terms of like not being able to travel, but when we did, we actually, utilize that time properly and had some amazing experiences you know like whether that be like complex con or me coming to your side of the neck of the woods or yeah. your 30th birthday which is fucking hilarious <laughs> which i still want to that's a that's a rabbit hole so i'm stoked by that um long story short if if you want to know about dave's 30th birthday if you weren't there he hosted his own art event <laughs> And then after the art event just got wasted and I was with his family who are Polish and I learned how to say happy birthday in Polish. But I also uh, was able to make them maybe sing it to him about 40 times in one night. So uh, it's just, yeah, kind of had to be there, but it was hilarious. Um, what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> COVID. I, I mean, <laughs> it was mad about COVID. No, I mean, but, 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 oh, but yeah. you're, you're right. Um, our friendship definitely, I think, increased and got much better. Like even in, in, it was like May, May, like two months after COVID, like I flew across to Portland. We drove from Portland down to, down to California, to LA when nobody was traveling. So yeah, we've, uh, we've was, been able, we've been really. Uh, and I, oh, listen, right, this is another pinch moment. And it's, this is not fanboying because he's somebody I look up to. Do you know what I mean? He's part, he's part of the industry. He has been here and is someone I set my sights on. It was like meeting Jeff Staple. Jeff is one of the like realest people I've ever met in terms of like being in an industry. Mm. You know I mean, I, I was fortunate to meet him through Concept Kicks. Uh, he was the first person to interview me on video for this Timberland construct. But then <laughs> this is like driving down to LA. We go, we, whatever, 17 hours, 18 hours. We yeah. go and visit our friend Neil, who is, was, was the director. And I think he's, he's, he's might be back with ComplexCon. He was the director of ComplexCon, essentially, and we went and visited him. We're inside his house for five minutes because we just need to use his restroom. Come out, my car is just scratched. There's a massive key mark that goes all the way around the car. I was like, really? And Dave was like, damn, you know. Dave's hold, holding his home. He's not actually shouting. He's not getting upset. And I was like, bro, I, I can't get upset. Like, whatever. Like, this trip's been great. You know, let's just just charge it to the game. Yeah, um, we, we yeah. a lot of charge it to the game. Right? Like, we, uh, we, we had the... Then we went to... No, sorry, yeah, we went for breakfast the next morning with Jeff. <laughs> it just was showing in my scratch. And it was just like, this, this is a hilarious moment. It was just like, the way you talk about those pinch me moments, it's like, we sat having breakfast with our friend, but then 15 year old me would be like, what the fuck are you doing having breakfast at IHOP with Jeff Staple in LA? Are you fucking well? Yeah. <laughs> He's giving me shit about my car. That's <laughs> like, bro. Oh, you're putting some fucking salt in the wounds here. But that was a, that was a dude. I'm so happy you brought that up. That was like one of those moments that like I never even think about or like I don't know why because it was a cool moment. It was just the three of us just hanging out at like a Denny's or an IHOP on a fucking Sunday morning with with Jeff. Yeah, I'm like, we're talking about shit and all I'm thinking about it's like, fuck, how much is this scratch going to cost me? Do I have to go through my insurance? Do I have to get wrapped? And Jeff tells me, oh, yeah. That's like a $14,000 paint job. And I was like, bro, 
I can't afford fourteen thousand dollars. What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, and it wasn't was a fourteen thousand dollars payment. Okay. Yeah, that was a that was a that was a good trip. Um. Anyway, back back to um. Oh yeah, back to the question. Uh. Yeah. Where, where um, you know, we got through we got through COVID land. You're obviously in a in a much different place. Um. You have, I think, established yourself in Portland. You know, people like you've you've built really foundational um, people and 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 things and hobbies around you, which I've seen a difference in you, um, kind of just emotionally, mentally. Um, do you think about you know some of those future pinch me moments or what you want to accomplish in the future? Like, is there anything um, that you think about, even like? on a personal level, take, take the career out of it. But, you know, is there anything you think about, or do you just now focus on the right now and what's in front of you? I think mainly just focus on what's in front of me. Cause you no, know, look, it sounds really fucking cliche, but the reality is all you've got is what's in front of you at this point. Do you know what I mean? So you're going to make the most of it. I feel fortunate enough now because like, like to the point I started, I trained jujitsu uh, during and after college and, and MMA and, Muay Thai, boxing, etc., and jujitsu was the thing that stuck with me. And then when I moved to the US or moved to Oregon, I knew that Portland was a mecca of jujitsu just because of the people who trained here. And I wanted to start training when I moved here, but due to COVID, obviously, like you know, close interaction with people is just not possible. Um, so I kind of bookmarked that. And then after COVID, um, because of Bryce and because of the network Bryce had, um, his friend Le Lawrence, who is the co-owner of hyperfly which is a jiu-jitsu company um was with uh with us at like bryce's place watching the ufc and bryce is like oh yeah dave used to do jiu-jitsu and mma and stuff like you should get him on doing this shit and it's like kind of embarrassing for me because i'm like bro you're telling like a guy who is a purple belt that's probably been doing this for the best part of his life that i used to do jiu-jitsu <laughs> that's so corny and shit but then it was like, it's a striking moment. They're like, shit, I got to get back into jujitsu. Like, that's where the community is. Because when I was a kid, I used to skate and that's where the community was. And then mm -hmm. when I did jujitsu, I saw a very similar kind of like architecture or community or even like mindset towards this, like, you have to achieve this thing and it's going to be hard to achieve. But the only way you can do it is by doing it until you get it. You know what I mean? It's the same with like learning jujitsu or doing a trick on a skateboard. And then through jujitsu, you know, I, I, you know, I'm like, I'm, if I get a hold of something, I get obsessed by it. You know what I mean? I have to like give my all in order to make it work. And that's why I think I've kept it my career in footwear. But then with jujitsu, it's like, I got to get in shape. I can't let these like newbies who are like younger than me get better than me. I got to get better than them. They're like, damn, I'm in my thirties. You know, like if I was still 20 something, I'd be killing people. And then learning that certain people who were, who I trained with, who are still in the community when I was, you know, I trained with them when I was 21, and they're still in the community now and they're doing crazy things like, uh, specifically as a fellow called Stuart Cooper, trained with him when he was a purple belt and I was a blue belt. And now he's like a black belt, but he's just so well known by the industry because he records the industry. And like he, he's one of the early documentarians of jujitsu in terms of like the modern space. and. Where I trained just so happened that Phil, my master sensei and good friend, um, he was close friends with Stu. I'm like, what the fuck is this? This world's tiny. But I trained at 10th Planet. And 10th Planet is, um, if you're familiar with like Joe Rogan, UFC, MMA, um, 10th Planet is ran and owned by Eddie Bravo, who's one of the, who I would say is one of the funniest, most interesting people you've ever seen. Um, whether if you've not seen him on like podcasts or anything or on TV, he's just a funny guy, but he's filled with wealth. And anyway, I'm trying to get to the point. It's like I've met a bunch of people who I would consider brothers now because, you know, we've, we've killed each other a thousand times on the mats and we'd kill for each other a thousand times off the mats. And um, one thing that jujitsu offers, which I think I've kind of translated into my life now is like the belt ranking system. I came to jiu-jitsu and I was a blue belt because I was given my blue belt many years earlier but then I've had to come back and relearn all the mechanics and start from scratch again I still am the blue belt you know I'm still ready and patient to keep working for for my goals that next belt or even just keep going until my body gives up essentially mm. um and 
I relate the belt ranking system to my career, you know, like where I was at at different periods of my life. In the footwear industry, I would say I'm a black belt, you know, like I've done more than most people can, could say, you know, like I've, I've been educated in footwear. I was obsessed with footwear before that. Uh, I've ran companies, I've started small companies with, with other companies, I've worked in marketing, buying, sales, development, et cetera, whatever, I'll keep harping on about all that crap. But in terms of where I'm at, at like my current career or current job role, I would say I'm like mid-level, I was, or mid-upper where I would say like I'm a purple belt. So the ranking in jujitsu is like white, blue, purple, brown, black. Mm. And then at Nike, I'd probably say I'm in the middle. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, I'm not capable of being a black belt. It's saying that there's still a lot to learn in a corporation like that. And it's not just learning how to design shoes. It's learning mm. how to talk to people, how to present yourself in meetings, how to present an idea, how to collect a team and gather people together to have the same vision. Um, you know, de dealing with egos or not dealing with egos, you know, like I, I, the, the, there's more to being a footwear designer or being in the industry than just being able to design a shoe. I mean, by all means, you can join a company and design a shoe and that's it. But if you want to get somewhere, you're going to have to learn how to talk, talk or, you know, find the right people to, to help you maneuver in the direction you want to go. So I think that is um, tremendous advice for anybody listening who wants to get in. One of the questions I've actually been asking for anybody coming on as with footwear experience of late is I've been asking them, what advice would you give to other people? And I think what you just summarized is absolutely like perfect, right? Because it's, there's, yeah. there's, there's so many yeah. different roles and opportunities within the industry, but there's also a lot of the interpersonal stuff, inner workings that, that can elevate your career or dismantle your career, depending on how you approach it. You're, you're only as strong as the network around you, man. Like, you know, they say it's as strong as the five people around you. No, you're as strong as the network around you. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, I feel like I'm fortunate. I think a lot of us who know one another feel fortunate that we know each other because we can reach out to one another in moments that we need somebody else who understands. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I have friends in Italy, I have friends in the UK, I have friends in Asia, I've got friends on the other side of America, like yourself, you know, and the people down the road. But we all share the same things, like our love for footwear, and we we understand the kind of like the energy it takes or the sacrifice it takes, and I think like come together. So I, I was I actually said this the other day. It's like trust, and I think you've said this before in the past as well. It's like we we know what it is. It's like you've got to trust yourself. You've got to trust the process because you'll get what you want as long as you trust the process. Just keep going. And then trust the people around you, whether that be your team or the network that you have. Mm. I think those are like the things that you need. And I think with trust comes patience. So I was like, probably trust yourself, trust your intuition, be patient and gather people you love who can lift you up. So mm. maybe that's, that's awesome. Advice. Yeah. That's great. No, I, I appreciate you expanding on that and that point. What, um, what do you think is the, the biggest thing that people misunderstand about you as a, as a creative or as a person, um, personal or, know. yeah, I, I, I was thinking as you were talking, I'm like, I, I just know how deep your knowledge base goes. And, you know, I, I know you've, you've just covered so much ground and, you know, here's an opportunity to just be like, what, what do you think people misunderstand you most for? Uh, I think it's probably different levels. My, my dad always used to say, oh, I'm just misunderstood. Like he himself would always say that he's misunderstood. And having had time to look back on him and his life, I see some commonalities between me and him in that respect. Like, I don't, you know, I haven't come through like a normal education system. I don't have a degree in product design or industrial design or architecture. I literally have a degree in footwear design and making. You know what I mean? Um... And I feel like maybe the misunderstanding comes from like people not, I, I think it's hard sometimes for people to comprehend like somebody who might be young, who might have more experience than them. Mm. I think like, and it doesn't, and when my kind of point of view or expertise comes into a scenario, don't, I think people kind of maybe misunderstand that I'm not trying to like step in or put 
my fingerprint on this project or whatever, but I come from a place of like, have you considered because there's other opportunities or options? You know what I mean? I think like, I think maybe it's misunderstood that I'm, I have quite an open mind to things. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. I think, you know, this is like, sometimes I can be really serious. Sometimes mm. I'm like goofy as hell. I think maybe that confuses people sometimes, <laughs> personality-wise. It's like, who the hell is this guy? What's you, could, you could also be a stubborn ass, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> could be all the above, dude. Um, I think, like, pinpoint an exact one. It's like, yeah, I think personally for me, and it's probably my ego, I would say, and I don't think there's anything wrong having an ego. I think it, it shows self-respect or self-worth. But I feel like people misunderstand maybe the experiences I have and how they have helped me formulate a perspective that can resolve situations or provide new ideas to new opportunities. I also think, you know, from, probably... from, from my perspective, there's probably, I wish just holistically across maybe the world, people were a little bit more empathetic to putting their 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 feet in other people's shoes and understanding everything that we've covered on this episode of like, you've moved across the country, you've sacrificed relationships, you've done this stuff for the better of of today. And my experiences go a long way. And 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 I think that 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 that's not valued as high as it probably should be. But um, I think being yeah. people recognizing that and if you're listening, and, and you know, Dave, just recognize it, maybe. And because um, I think it's yeah. I think it's super valuable. I, I I think also there's like interesting, you know, when you're in a boardroom, there's a lot of voices, there's a lot of people that want to be seen and heard. And sometimes I just don't say anything. I'll just listen. And then I think people think I'm not contributing to the situation where it's like, I'm not really not contributing to the situation. I'm seeing you all talk about it, but I might not have the authority to say what might work. So I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Mm. You know, sometimes that works a benefit or to my detriment and i think that goes for anybody right but then sometimes i might open my mouth and it might be a, i don't know maybe it's my personality type maybe it's the way i come across maybe because I'm a, I'm a british person or an english person in an american environment people perceive british people as maybe being a little bit crass coarse or like hard <laughs> or to the point and I, sometimes i'm just to the point you know let's just deal with this and i think it rub, it could rub some people the wrong way i'm not saying that it does it, I think it could maybe, you know, affect you in an environment negatively, depending on who's in that space. Mm. Um, but I would say that like, yeah, I don't know. There's that misunderstanding of like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being quiet because I don't need to add anything and I know what's going to happen next. Or I have to say something here and it doesn't come from a place of like me wanting to be heard. It comes from a place of like, guys, like, have you thought about this kind of thing? Mm. Um, I don't know if that, that helps. Yeah, I no, I, I, I definitely think so. Um, as, uh, as we wrap up, Dave, is there, is there anything that you think um, you want to share with anybody? Because I know this is, we talked right before we started recording, uh, and I'm so excited, not only because this is episode 100, but it's because this is your first podcast recording. So you've never been on, on a podcast before. So I hope this actually sparks a bunch of other people trying to get you for interviews. Cause that'd be awesome. Um, but is there anything you want to, uh, I no, I was just saying, it's like, it's kind of funny cause we haven't done, I've never done a podcast, but you remember when we used to do, um, clubhouse <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. like stint during COVID when we just clubhouse, like, I think that's the closest thing I've been to a podcast. Those were those were cool. So for for context for anybody listening during during the pandemic, Clubhouse had a moment uh, in terms of a new app, a new social app, and it was it was kind of interesting because you had to get invited to it. So it kind of made it feel like an exclusive club to a certain percent uh, perspective. And um, and on Sundays, we uh, myself, you, Mark, who's been on the podcast, um, Daniel would show up, uh, Suzanne, Helen. Just a bunch of like oh, you know tremendous footwear creatives would would pop into this room and we'd have a conversation around footwear as a whole and creativity and uh, we talk about egos a lot like we talked about everything it was a really unique moment yeah I, I, to me I think that was one of the most educating moments in terms of like 
being in the industry. You know what I mean, hearing from people like you know Stephanie, who you work with now, yeah, like how where she came from, she's part of that. You know what I mean? She's she's such a, a well versed individual from in terms of the industry. You know, mm. uh, not just creating some iconic products, but then like we had other people from a wealth of backgrounds within the photo industry joining these conversations, bringing in their perspective. You know, shoe dogs who'd been in it for forty years, fifty years, up to like people like, hey, you know, I'm really trying to get into industry. How do I do it? You know what I mean? It's, I just, uh, it was such an eye-opening moment. Yeah, I look back, I'm grateful for those moments, dude. I know I'm, 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 really, I'm sad that, you know, COVID happened and it created what it did, but at the same time, I'm grateful for the opportunities it presented, so. Yeah, no, th th those are really amazing conversations. And I know Clubhouse eventually released a, a recording uh, application or function to the application. Um, but those oh. all happened pre-recorded. So uh, it was kind of just like you had to be there to, to experience it. Is there um, archives? Yeah. Is there uh, if if somebody was listening to this or still is listening to this and they want to get into the photo industry, Dave, what, what is there one piece of advice you would give somebody like just like what's one thing that can separate them from anything else? Um, I would probably say just be persistent. You definitely have to reach out to people who work in the industry. You have to understand that you might not get answered by certain people. You might get answered by those people you don't expect you get answered by. But you have to reach out and you have to be, you know, unafraid to expose yourself to, especially in this world now where we know that social media is so powerful. You know, there are people who are blowing up on social media who have very minimal experience. But they're incredibly talented. So I think like sharing your work is important. Um, I think patience is a massive thing because you're going to learn along the way that there's going to be bumps that really affect you emotionally. Maybe that's somebody copying your work. Mm. Maybe that's your hero not talking back to you and then you find out you don't like them because they don't actually like you for some reason or not. You know what I mean? Um, it might be that you reach out to a company for an internship and you, you get knocked back. You know, you might reach out for an internship, pull you in. I don't know. It's, it's, to me, it's you have to have conversations with people in in and around the industry, and then the, and just you know show your work. I think that's a that's, and like dude, we live in a generation now. It's like if I could go back and share all my work that I did through Fry to Univer in high school, in sixth form college, in university, in my like first jobs, what I did when I was looking for work then when the instagram started popping off you know dude fucking, i would share everything there's so yeah. much shit <laughs> yeah and i just think that like I, um like mike sturge like is a perfect example of somebody I, I think is like doing it right like the guy is just hammering out work and mike if you're listening to this this is no offense bro like your work has come such a long way and it's evident you know what i mean it's like being where you where using him as an example where his his ideas were to where they are now he's just Night improved day. exponentially so he's just invested himself into it and that's the other thing is just invest yourself into it if you want it you got to work for it it's not going to be handed to you you've got to really knock on some doors and talk to the right people i don't know dude it's like the whole thing with just finding people who are similar to yourself who you know you can just you not see for a couple of months and then when you see each other it's like nothing's changed yeah no, that's exactly how, how we are. It's like, I think, thinking about this and thinking about my partner, Sade, I think about, like, the people in my life now who I have closest to me, the people who have lived sacrifice. Because everybody who I'm close to has the experience or has had experiences that could, you know, be equivalent to a sacrifice. You know, whether that's losing family, you know, moving to another country, putting others before yourself. Um, like, to me, that is one of the major, you know, things that you have in yourself is that you put others before yourself. And I commend you on that. And even so it's like, Sade, my partner, you know, she she has sacrificed her career and, and as a professional football player to be a designer and also is doing really well in the job that she's in. Do you know what I mean? She's willing to, to do that. And, you know, I think that that's a major thing. What I value now is the people around me 
are able to sacrifice or have sacrificed and have respect for others who have done that so or recognize that in others so yeah i think probably that's also maybe maybe that's a big takeaway for anybody that kind of is thinking about taking the next steps in their life is like what are you willing to sacrifice you know but make sure your happiness isn't that one thing but it can be that one thing um dave last last uh last question and it's really just a hint at uh where people can find you and your social handles but where does the footwear composer come from so people could find you on on instagram as the footwear composer uh where tell the story behind is it just your name now it's my name i'm just i'm the footwork composer bro the footwork <laughs> composer <laughs> at the footwork composer now it basically came from uh i, I think like dom the shoe surgeon inspired me because it was like you know there's people out there on, on instagram with names that you know really reflect what they do mm. and i was like you know what I, it was to me felt like a massive risk because i was changing my name that everybody had known for so long which is Davmore or Davmao, whoever you, whoever you want to say, it, D-A-V-M-A-W. And then I changed it to the Footwork Composer because I kind of named myself that. And then when we did that um, collaboration with Takashi, I changed it back because I felt like it was more memorable. Mm. Uh, maybe it was a little bit of a hindrance at the time because it was like a crossover between ta- like handles. Um, but essentially it's like all I've ever known from Korea is footwear. And prior to my career in footwear was footwear, even though I had other hobbies and things going on in my life. So I was like, ah, you know what? I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to call myself the footwear composer. Because it's not just, I don't just design shoes. I do everything around shoes. I'm capable of doing all the things around shoes, not just draw them and make them ready for production. So it's, you know, the footwear composer. It's me. That's it. (laughs) <laughs> that is a that is a beautiful way uh of ending this episode dave no bro i just i'm just grateful for you i'm grateful for everything you've done i'm grateful for you being you as as are the 99 other individuals who had the opportunity to speak to you you know what i mean like i think that for me i i cherish you as one of my best friends you know what i mean somebody i would i would go i would down the hill for you know if you needed me to come to battle i would come to battle i would destroy any opponent that ever got in our way Sorry, that's a bit aggressive, but it's true. Um, and I think that, you know, like you, you to me are a perfect example of somebody who embodies the go get it attitude. And I feel like you are somebody who is going to reap the benefits of the rewards or, you know, like you're a good person. You give a lot and I feel like a lot is coming your way and I feel like a lot has come your way. So, yeah, in essence, I'm just grateful that I have you as as one of my closest friends and I'm grateful that other people get to have you in their lives too. So. Wow, that's uh, very, very nice, Dave. I appreciate that a lot. That means a lot. I, 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 I say that semi jokingly, but I do, do mean it. Um, your, your friendship is, is, uh, it's weird because like, I don't have a ton of friends in my life. Like, I've really weeded out a ton of people. Like, I've, you've met them. My three closest friends from like high school from Connecticut, and then I have like a couple friends here in Worcester, but outside of that, like my, the, my inner circle, my close circle is, is very, very tight. And, and I'm, I'm stoked that you're, you're part of it. That's mine.